I'm going to hand it off to Christos to give us some updates. Yes. So I, I'd like to say I'm really happy, and I mean it, really happy to be here with you after a some months. Uh, and uh, there could be a better time, because as uh, we're uh, entering the holidays, uh, good tidings I bring to you <laughs> in terms of our work. So uh, here's, here's what I have to report in terms of progress at uh, the canal. Uh, what we have done up to now is uh, we have uh, completed the pilot study that was done at the Fort Street Basin and uh, we have uh, drawn our conclusions, what we needed, on uh, how to proceed, what means and methods we are going to use uh, in order to clean up the, the canal problem. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two, we have completed the 95% design for the construction of the foot on barrier, uh, that is uh, the, the barrier wall, the bulkhead, from the top of the canal to Union Street on the eastern side, the park slope side of the canal, uh, which will protect uh, power from coming into the canal and decontaminate. Uh, so we have completed the 95% design. We also are working very closely with uh, the Department of uh, Design and uh, Construction of New York City. Uh, we have, uh, well, we anticipate to receive the 95% design by January 3rd of uh, this coming year. So, for one. I'm sorry, yeah, for Turning Basin 1, for the excavation and restoration of Turning Basin 1. Good point. <laughs> So what does all this mean? It means that uh, right now, from uh, a technical point of view, uh, by spring, very soon, we will be able to start the countdown of the cleanup of the canal, counting in months, not in years. So that is, uh, that's what all this work means. Updates. One, again working closely with uh, the Department of uh, Design and Construction of New York City, uh, we are about to grant approval to them uh, to proceed with the construction of uh, two large, larger than presently stormwater pipes at the 9th Street on either side of the canal. Uh, and th those pipes, and so I anticipate to grant approval in within days or weeks at the most, uh, and those pipes will alleviate uh, flooding in, you know, at that area, and we, they will also have, at the point of discharge, they will have treatment, for, so that the water that is discharged into the canal, it will be clean, it will be treated. So that is another highlight. Uh, and then there's one more thing, which uh, I'm, I'm happy to say, that all these objects that we fished out of uh, the Fort Street Basin during the dredging, of the dredging pilot, uh, those objects will be brought to the staging area in the middle of the canal, a public place, if they are not already there. And I, from what I have read so far from the archaeologist reports, the, you know, the, the, uh, the archaeologists who are doing the, the sorting, uh, chances are that most of these materials are not going to be of, uh, of historic importance, archaeological importance. However, we recognize... National. <coughs> On a national level? Yeah. However, we realize, so they will not be preservable from, from the archaeological point of view, you know, within the context of a uh, uh, super uh, However, we have realized in, conversing with you that uh, there is an interest from the community to preserve uh, some of that as a history of the community. So we are going to set a tentative date, and I'm setting it right now, uh, uh, the week of December 10th, okay, so for viewing by interested members of the CAG, you know, or organizations, 
for viewing those uh, the, uh, those uh, objects. Uh, then arrange arrangements will have to be made by the parties that are interested in taking possession of those objects. Be it the Guanas, uh, does the Guanas Museum still exist? Uh, or uh, yeah. so any organization that wants to, to take possession of this, uh, of those objects will be allowed. But we will keep them there for uh, a limited time. So it will be uh, somewhere in the middle of the, or the uh, you know, they will be stored there until the middle or end of January 2019. Okay? So uh, that's all the updates uh, that I get to give you. And I believe uh, there's a Brian, would you like to do an update on uh, the acquisition? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, within the last month, the city has acquired the properties that uh, they uh, were given the opportunity to acquire for constructing the tank uh, at the head of the canal. And as a result of that, um, the uh, design of a tank for the uh, park is no longer required. And under the order we have a national grid, the design for the cleanup of the park uh, is going to proceed, and we should have schedules uh, in the coming uh, probably six months uh, projecting uh, how long that uh, process will take to design and implement that, including the uh, location and design of the temporary uh, pool uh, or pools, and um, uh, we will keep you informed as that process proceeds. Uh, one of the benefits of, of this, uh, the fact that the tank is not going to be in the park, is that the um, park cleanup will proceed faster than if the tank was going in there. We'll be able to work on, on sections uh, at a time instead of doing one sort of giant excavation. Uh, so that means that uh, in the long run, um, Park will be out of commission for a shorter period of time. So we will uh, update you uh, step by step as, as we go through that process. Uh, but um, uh, the cleanup of the park is um, kind of a slightly secondary process to uh, getting like the pulpit wall constructed and uh, some of the other parts moving in order to get the treasure that went. So uh, we'll tell you more about that as we go. Thanks, Brian. Uh, when I mentioned about the first invasion, I just want to make this point, and let's give it a, an applause. It's the first time that the canal has a, a portion of the canal has a clean, a clean bottom in 150 years. Woo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we all know how important a clean bottom can be. <laughs> I'm going to bring a chair. There's one seat over here, if somebody wants to come in. Yeah. Okay. And there's one on the wall over here. So with that, I'll hand it over to the regional administrator. I don't know. We'll try with we have uh, feedback with the mic. I'm, I'm not a booming baritone or bass. I'm a, I'm more of a lyric tenor, but I'll, I'll do my best. And I'll try not to burst into song. I don't want to torture you. Uh, I'm Pete. I'm the regional administrator for US EPA Region 2. And I, as you know, we represent New York, New Jersey, uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and eight federally recognized Indian nations. Um, you folks have been with this process a long time, so I, I don't need to go any further with that. I, I think what you do know is that we have a team of very dedicated folks who, who are joining with you, also dedicated and passionate uh, to try to find the best response to, to addressing uh, legacy contamination in Guanas, as well as addressing uh, combined sewer overflows, which again are a concern for public health. And that's really, that's why we're here. And we're very thrilled to see the strength of this CAG. As you know, uh, EPA has hundreds and thousands of super funds. Uh, we have hundreds and thousands of CAGs. Um, to my knowledge, this is one of the most regarded CAGs in Region 2, if not nationally. And again, it's a function of your dedication and your, your passion, as 
members of the community. So with that, that, with that said, I just want to highlight some of my staff who are here. You heard some introductions. So we have Natalie, of course, who's on the ground with you. Christos is on the ground with you. Uh, Brian is on the ground with you on a regular basis. Uh, additionally, Doug, uh, working with our water division, uh, is the super fun, I'm sorry, super fun division. Um, Elias is part of our uh, public relations team. Uh, Chris Lyons, the chief of staff, and of course, you all know Walter. Uh, Walter Martin, who has uh, spent much of his year uh, working on sites like this uh, across Richmond to his very well regarded in his, uh, his own right. Um, we have, I have this is my second meeting. Like the first one I attended with Congresswoman Velasquez. And I forget exactly what the location was. It was, uh, it was a packed house. It was in the White House. Yeah. yeah, it was a great, great location, good turnout. Um, and again, that gave me my first impressions of the community, and this is very much a community. This is not a group of isolated individuals just randomly coming together. You're, you're clearly connected and clearly driven. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the, the, the role and the engagement of the city, uh, both in terms of uh, advancing projects as a PRP, but also as a facilitator. So I know that we have the Department of Planning is here and the representative from DEP. Folks, if you want to just signal, just yeah, there we are. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we also have um, additional PRP, National Grid. So thank you for joining us. Uh, also with the state, our state partners from EDC and Department of Health. And again, as we do our work, uh, understandably, uh, in this instance, uh, we're not just dealing with, with toxic remediation. We're also dealing with the compliance sewer overflow. So actually, EDC and DOH both have roles and we just happen to be doing a project that is trying to incorporate remedy for both in one. Um, one thing I just want to share with you, I'm just kind of working on my points here to make sure I don't miss anything, but uh, we did have Acting Administrator Wheeler, who, who was, uh, was deputy at the time, come down and visit the, uh, the site. And we had a chance to walk along, we, we witnessed the pilot project uh, in progress. Uh, he had a chance to meet with some young people who were doing some science projects. I think they were uh, in some wildlife, uh, seeing what they're putting in there. And yeah, they're testing the biota and checking water quality. And, and it was, uh, for all of us, it was good to see uh, the community engagement of our young people also having an interest in the environment <coughs> and trying to understand cause and effect, what, what causes environmental degradation, how do we respond. So that was a, a very, uh, in between raindrops, I think we celebrated that. And also, we, we took note of the, of the pilot. Um, I know there was some sensitivity with Whole Foods. And again, from my standpoint, I know that that issue will be resolved, uh, and that was a function of testing. We tried to test the methodologies for showing up those banks, uh, which, as we know, have all been reinforced in different ways, um, some more structurally sound than others, and we want to make sure that those, those side walls are secure uh, as we move forward with the dredging. Um, we had some, some discussion of uh, historic preservation, and I, I briefly chatted with Marlene and Linda. Um, and um, so I, I know that there is uh, concern with, with the, the building, the Nevin Street facade, and there have been a series of recommendations that have been put for historic preservation as a play role here with making recommendations. I know we talk a little bit with the councilman's office, I want to recognize, I recognize the councilman's office as well. Um, and I know your conversation goes beyond this and also community character, what build out looks like in the community over time, that's also of interest to you, as it should be. Um, but in regard to the facade, uh, we've had a number of, of presentations made to us. Um, I do have to say, and I, no offense to my colleagues, uh, I, I'm not quite sure yet that, that I have uh, a consensus from the CAG. So at some point, uh, this measure is not closed, this issue is not closed. We have some recommendations, some are very aesthetically appealing, uh, some attempt to capture the, the flavor uh, and the history of that of the, of the building. Um, but as we look at that, I'm, I'm still personally not convinced that we have consensus if there is consensus. So at some point, when we have this discussion still open, I would be interested in determining how we can get a better feel uh, for the CAG's recommendations. Now, ultimately, we make a recommendation to the city, and the city would have to address it as part of their building. So that would be the next step. Um, also, uh, points of sensitivity, uh, you know, we know that parcels 1, 6, and 7 on Nevins have been acquired. 
uh, we've had some conversation with property owners who did put together a, a very, I thought, a very unique <coughs> engagement working with the Congresswoman's office, uh, with the Councilman's office, uh, with the city and other partners of state uh, to provide additional support uh, for affected businesses that would be dislocated. And uh, so we're hoping that um, that effort takes root and that these businesses uh, are able to relocate and maintain their contributions to the community. The, um, just trying to see what else we have. Oh, uh, just one other point. Recently we've had the city DEP approach us to, to uh, advance a concept of replacing the tank, um, these large uh, collection tanks, uh, with, with an alternate uh, structure, a tunnel or a series of tunnels intended to give some other operational capability to the city. Um, that's newly on our desk. We're trying to understand the pros and cons of that. And uh, again, ultimately, the decision from EPA will be uh, what does that mean for the construction uh, progression of the time frame? And ultimately, uh, tunnel versus tank, uh, is there a superior environmental benefit that may come from one or the other? And so those are the two metrics. So we're, I'm going to be leaning on my staff to give me their most objective read, and also I've asked the commissioner <coughs> to help me understand uh, more succinctly um, what sort of benefits accrue to the city uh, by pursuing a, a tunnel methodology versus the tank. So with that said, uh, I'm going to stop my infomercial, hey. and I'd rather turn it to you folks. Uh, I, I know you're engaged. I'm more interested in hearing your concerns or questions or issues. So gag member questions, as usual, if you use your cards to identify yourselves, and Go to you in so order. I guess the facilitators take it over, so I'll just try to respond. Just, I, just want, I just want to make sure you, <laughs> Thank you, you. you get everyone uh, yes, in order. Course. They get cranky if they don't go in order. And, you know, one thing I do. Okay, so I'll rely on you to help me. So, so, Diane. <laughs> so they can be cranky at you. Yeah, that, that's my job. Yeah, I, I get the cranky. Um, yeah. um, I'm, you know, I think this is the second time I've heard the word tunnel. Yes. And I'm not quite certain how where a tunnel would go how it would impact putting in the proposed remediation at the bottom of the canal, how exactly would a tunnel replace tanks or be instead of tanks, and has, has any, are there any design plans that have been submitted, even in the roughest sense, to give EPA an idea of what this tunnel would be? Yeah, so we're, to answer your question, we're, we're at the very uh, cursory level of review. Again, the city advanced a concept, and again, we would look for more detail from them. And, and ultimately, as we understand it, but just conceptually, my understanding would be something uh, down quite deep. And the intent would be to use it for storage. Those tunnels would be a mechanism for water storage as opposed to using the tank for water storage. The other piece that I understand, and this is just conceptually, might also give the city the ability to shift water around and direct it Again, ultimately, we want any, any excess water treated before it's released. Uh, and this would give them, I, as I understand it, conceptually, an ability to better manage water. But, but we don't have all the details. But is, are the tunnels, as you think of them, in the bottom of the canal? As no, they would be much deeper. So they, the canal goes down, what, 18, 20 feet? No, these would be deep underground, and these would be very large uh, constructs capable of holding combine two overflow. That, that's the intent of it. So, so again, at a very cursory level right now, we're asking for more information from the city. I've always found it fascinating how there is enough information that we have already in anybody about existing flushing from the copy. I haven't existed for a long time. We're not in use. And no one is doing anything about it for years. What's going on with the flushing tunnel as the city originally imagined? So uh, that question I would have to defer to my colleagues, and, and also we have the CDUA also in the city. Uh, the question is, uh, wh what is the status of flushing tunnels as constructed? In, uh, what is their status and how are they operating? I don't know if anyone is able to answer that. I, I can't answer this it if that's the, okay. One of our colleagues. Sure, Kevin Clark. So. The flushing tunnel was fully reactivated in May of 2014, and it's been um, it's been run consistently since then. It pumps an average of about 215 million gallons per day from the East River to the head of the Canal. 
that was to flush the canal and it would flow through the canal, correct? Is that the, yeah, the, other, the other tunnel that should be mentioned here is the Butler Street Tunnel, which is 16 feet wide and it goes from Fourth Avenue roughly to Devon Street and is an existing tunnel which is underutilized. So maybe you can clarify if that is what is meant by the city repurposing an existing tunnel. Yeah, so I, from, from uh, what's been approached to us is uh, I haven't had any distinction made between repurposed or new. So right now the only construct in front of us is what we consider a series of tunnels. So I, I don't think we have a delineation of new versus existing being repurposed or new construction. Uh, PEP, I don't know if you have any... It would be a new tunnel. Okay. That, that would propose. Uh, I just have a statement, only which is that so late in the game, after all the fighting about the, the container and using eminent domain to take over land and doing all kinds of things to change, to introduce a new concept now, seems to be unusual and it deserves a lot of our attention. And at the same time, I hope it wouldn't delay the, you know, the city's part of that project. Yeah, so, so for me, I'm baby new year here, a year, a year now. Um, as I as I try to problem solve, I try to be as objective as I can, and I try as much as I can to weigh cost and value. So those costs may be quantitative, they may be measurable, hard numbers, they may be qualitative, they may be something more more abstract, quality of life, for example. So uh, what I've asked my staff to do, uh, because staff have their own opinions, uh, I've asked them to set their opinions aside and give me the most objective read. Uh, and again, in, in the in the uh, most extreme sense, what I would see weighing, as I mentioned before, would be uh, what, if any, impact does it have on timeline uh, and, and current progression? And on the other side, what, if any, additional environmental benefit accrues from this separate, from this different construct? So, so that would be that. That's what I'm most interested in, and I, that's really my obligation is to try to understand the, the, the balance between those two. And again, work with CAG and, and other partners to determine, once we understand what, what the costs and benefits are, what makes the most sense in the situation. So um, our goal would be to be thorough, uh, not to delay uh, the progression, but to be as thorough as we can, uh, again, recognizing that it's a relatively new uh, entry into the arena, so to speak. At a late stage of the game. Understood. Right. Yes, sir. Hildegard? So um, I'm, you know, I'm compulsively perusing the nine minimum CSO controls, and I'm looking for this in that document. So this would this would be like online storage, and would there be online inline treatment there, in the in the tanks, or would would the would the flow continue to be treated through the, through the head house? So are you I'm, haven't gotten that far. I'm working from a, a cursory uh, uh, engagement here, and we're due to have more information. My understanding is it would be storage uh, again as as the tanks would be that would then slowly be fed into filtration, uh, and then eventually discharge. Um, and can I ask another question? Yes, please. So, uh, I say that, uh, Mr. Facilitator. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I exceeded my authority. <laughs> so, uh, early on, um, Christos mentioned um, two new 9th Street tunnels and mentioned something about treatment. Yeah. Can you elucidate, please, gentlemen? Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, so, what we say is that anything that discharges in, into the canal mm -hmm. has to be treated. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, those are going to be video pipes, uh, stormwater discharge pipes at 9th Street and at their end where they discharge into the canal, they're going to have treatment. What kind of treatment? Thank like you. That's, that's, a, that's a big word. Okay, so we're going to have treatment. So uh, there's a similar concept with the 3rd Avenue high level sewer where we're working with the city for a treatment uh, method. So down on 9th Street, uh, we are piloting two different types of treatment. On the one side, there's going to be an uh, uh, oil water separator, sim similar to what we have on First Street. And on the other side, uh, on the west side, uh, there will be uh, absorption mats, skimmers. Okay? The but goal is to get uh, runoff from the streets that have oils and, and separate those oils out before they go in the canal. Floatables? And floatables too? Yeah, yeah. There, there is in the, yeah. I mean, ours, uh, the floatable part is, uh, the city's concerns, 
uh, our concern was with the chemicals, but uh, my understanding is the system uh, includes incorporates everything. Yeah, I'm good. Lewis? Yeah, I had about four questions. Uh, I assume you're not going to be treating for any possible bacteriological problems? This is, this, is, this is a strong word. So they, they only capture water from the streets. I understand that they could easily have bacteriological pickups out of the street, etc. But nobody's going to be doing any right. testing and treatment for that, right? It, uh, customarily, it's not being done for some, for some, water, for some water. But at the times uh, where they collect large volumes of water uh, and it's combined with sewer, then that, that, that would be a good candidate for uh, that kind of thing. So if you have these tunnels, you obviously are not going to need the same kind of a footprint that you would have had if you had the tank, am I correct? That's the, uh, it, is the it is a different footprint. Yeah, it would be, so there's still a footprint above, but it's a but, but substantially less. It would be a different, <coughs> my understanding is there would be a footprint to, to excavate and then take down and then work horizontally. So you'd have to have ingress, you'd have to have a, a, a point of, of access and then tunneling from there. And you'd have to have the ability to move material in and out. Right. Um, so so that's, that's just me speculating on what the process would look, look like based on the uh, cursory introduction. And you're going to have but to... would be a different... For, so the and you'll have to <coughs> need some pump mechanism or something to make the material well, out. Yeah, I would think you need all the precautions to, to make sure that the integrity is maintained as you're constructing and reinforcing. So, so I'm not an engineer, I won't pretend to be, but uh, logically it makes sense to have any supporting uh, equipment needed to keep it dry, uh, workable, uh, breathable, <coughs> uh, stable, I mean, you need all of those. So what I'm really getting at is that you don't have the tanks and you don't need that space that was going to be reserved for the tanks, you're still going to need something, understood. That leaves that area where the tanks would have above on the ground side where the tanks would have been usable for other kinds of community uses? So from my standpoint, if, if you don't need the tanks, then, then, again, there's still some mitigation. Uh, the tanks themselves, was there any mitigation with the tank? Is it around the tank area? Yeah, I mean, people understand that the, the property is where the tank, let's take tank, the, the one at RHO 34. Uh, that property was going to have the tank underneath and then about a, about a third of the property or a third of the two properties was going to be used for the head house and the other two thirds was going to be turned into public space, open space, park mm -hmm. space. Um, you're correct that as we understand it, and again our understanding is cursory and, and at a preliminary level, um, there would be probably a somewhat slightly smaller footprint but they're still exactly as you say, they need to have a pump, a head house that has pumps because the whole point of the tunnel is to store the water, it's got to then get pumped out and pumped back into the system when the rain stops. So there'd still be above ground uh, mechanisms. You have to have elevator mechanisms so you can get down in there to <coughs> clean it on a regular basis and things like that. Too. Yeah, no, I'm only suggesting that we should keep our eye on the additional space that might be relieved yeah. because Understood. of the lack of the tank. The head house is going to be similar, probably. Yeah. Okay. Is that it, Liz? Uh, I had some questions about some of the other stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll come back. Keep, keep the card on. Peter? I, I think this is for Kevin more than uh, Peter, if that's okay. No and, offense. No. It's, um, <laughs> it's just we're, we're okay dealing with concepts, and I, I don't get what we're talking about here. Are we... Is it a well? Is it a, I mean, how can a tunnel be more efficient than the tanks? And if it's going straight down, how deep? You know, just ballpark, what are we talking about? Uh, you guys okay with the answer? I think the CAC's really interested in this concept. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so, so we're proposing, what, what we have you know, conceptually proposed is a tunnel that basically starts at the RH-34 site, so that's parcel six and seven that we recently acquired. There would be a construction shaft um, that is constructed on that on that site. Um, 
to lower tunnel boring machine, and then we would bore a tunnel <coughs> towards the other site, the OH007 site, and there would be another shaft there um, to either retrieve, to likely retrieve the TBM, or in some cases the TBM is actually abandoned, um, you know, just below the ground. Um, the tunnel would be, you know, somewhere on the order of about 125 to 150 feet. Uh, we would follow the alignment of the of the canal, so we stay below the existing right of way that uh, minimizes the impact on private properties and that sort of thing. Um, the storage volume um, would be more than the combined storage volume of of the two tanks. Uh, we're currently proposing a 16 to 17 million gallon tunnel, although you know that's something that would have to be further evaluated, you know, through some detailed planning and design. Um, and um, it would operate similar to the tanks during a wet weather event. Um, CSOs would be directed um, from the two outfalls into the tunnel at both locations, both at RH-34 and at OH-007. Um, and then following the storm, the tunnel would be pumped out and that flow would be sent to wastewater treatment for treatment. So, I, if I may, um, Commissioner Sapienza had asked if he should come tonight to talk about, about, the, uh, about tunnels, and again, we're we're at a very cursory level, but I, I would offer, I'm sure the commission, I don't mean to speak for DEP, but my sense is the department would be very happy to come back and give you as much information as they have, give you a full briefing on it. So I, I guess yeah, I would. Yeah, we'd be happy. We'd be happy to do that. Well, so why don't, we, well, why don't we say we're, we're going to ask that. We have some invitations going out. Uh, we'll get a full briefing. So uh, if you have detailed tunnel questions, maybe we'll hold those till that time. I'm very concerned about something like this, how it could not have impact on the cleanup processes that are going on in the canal, in the various parts of it, during the clean. I don't, I don't, hate, well, I guess because I turned 80, maybe I can't conceive of how it could not delay the cleanup process. And, this is one of the questions yeah, that we're going to be reviewing. Pete yeah. has indicated that he's asked uh, the staff to uh, come up with an objective assessment of the proposal, and that includes impacts on schedule, not just for the CSO collection, but impacts, if any, on schedule for the other elements of the cleanup. Benefits that can come from this for improved flood control, there's both sides of the issue have to be evaluated, and that's what Pete has asked for. Sure. And uh, the one thing I can tell you about Pete, he wouldn't say it to you, but I'll say it to you, is that he gets deeply into the details, and uh, he pays very, very close attention. Uh, he will not be talking about him, us only having a cursory view of it right now. That is true, it's initial, but uh, his view will not be cursory. He'll get into it in great detail. So, so back to your point, you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and again, the issue is what's the trade-off and, and what makes sense. So my only uh, observation is I don't want to prejudge it. I, I want to understand all the pros and cons so we can make collectively make the best decision. And one, one thing to be crystal clear about is that the city is under administrative order to do the design for the tanks. As you all know the tanks, that work is proceeding. Nothing is stops, they are obliged and are continuing with that the design effort. The only change is the one that Brian mentioned earlier, which is that they're no longer doing the parallel design for the Town of Screen Park location because they now have finalized the acquisition of uh, Parcel 6 and 7. Mark? Yeah, it is surprising, to, as this gentleman said, to hear of this at this late date, this, this immensely ambitious project. And I don't know how many of us have read The Great Bridge by David McCullough of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, I realize this is not underwater, but the guys who worked these men did in the caissons right. that were at the feet of the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. I highly recommend the book. And now, technology has advanced far since the 19th century. Sure. But my question really is, is this as deep as bedrock? Because this is a tremendously yeah. ambitious undertaking. You're going to have groundwater flooding in violently while you're attempting to create this space. There's going to be a vast amount of material that needs to be removed. We all want to know where that's going. Some of it's probably contaminated with coal tar, probably, mm -hmm. again. And, it's, and this is just such an ambitious project at that depth. 
I mean, granted that they're building these huge water tunnels hundreds of feet deep through solid bedrock. That's another story. If you drive in the bedrock hundreds of feet down. But my question is, this is not bedrock. I realize this is a technical question. Sure. And if it's not bedrock, you're dealing with waterlogged muck that's going to be caving in violently on you while you're trying to create a space where there is no space. So I, I just wonder at the wisdom of this plan at this, at this stage of the game when we've been hearing about this tank for years. So from, from my standpoint, and this is just my belief, if someone comes to me in good faith and asks me to look at something, in good faith I'm going to look at it. I appreciate they, they, that. They, I respect your presentation. Yeah, so, so, I just, off so, the top of my uneducated head, it sounds like so, uh, yeah, I'm a little a, big uh, All of us are deal. uneducated in some capacity. Okay, fair and, and all of us are ignorant on, on, on other things. So, so my hope would be understanding more detail from the city, both presenting to you and presenting to us, we would get a better sense of viability. Uh, Just by way of tunneling, function. if I could have one quick oh, more please. moment. Yeah, please. One thing I always point out to visitors to our region when we take them on a tour of the canal yeah. area is we, we take these two immense infrastructure projects for granted. The big viaduct that Robert Moses built over the whole mess and the IND subway F train that goes over the whole mess. Now why those people knew what they were doing and the path of least resistance for them was to build those gigundo structures over the whole low end of the canal rather than... Putting a tunnel up there wouldn't work. <laughs> well, but, but they could have tunnels but they did not and that is to be taken out. Right, the factual the answer to your question is this is not bedrock. The proposal okay. would be to have it in the, in the uh, sediment. Uh, it is, uh, there would be contamination in some of that sediment, and those are all understandable. So there's water pressure. Yeah. And so uh, my, my hope would be, as we review this, that we don't have tunnel vision. Don't get him a scar on pun. No, no, it's infectious. Too bad Terry Armstrong here tonight, and he would have pointed out about the water tunnel that already runs under the canal that he actually had an opportunity to walk under one before they had finished it. But there is a huge water tunnel, water drinking water tunnel under the canal. So my question was please. to back away from the tunnel questions and, and to go back to what Brian brought up about um, National Grid taking over the cleanup of the park and also <coughs> the first Street Basin work that um, in those design projects, are we mandating that they do remove the debris by way of barge or are these people being given leeway in those plans to take that across land um, um, in, the, in either of those cleanups or the removal of uh, debris on the first Street Basin work? Yes, next question. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I, sorry, you're talking about the tank design? Barge. Uh, both no, 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 both, um, the, both the, the, the park cleanup, cleanup and the park? The TV1 cleanup, uh, barge or truck? Are, they, will we, are we mandating removal through on by barge or will they be allowed to truck the... Okay, at this point we're not, we not mandating our preference. I, understanding the impacts on, on the community would be to be done by barge. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. We would have to consider the logistics though, at the time. What work is being done at the same time? Okay. Am I clear? Because uh, we can only fit so many barges in the canal. No. So, so what I'm saying is, if the tank, <coughs> if the tank construction is being done at the same time frame as the, I'm going to clean up at the park. Um, National Grid will be doing uh, that, and they well, are barging well, well, on the canal already. Yeah. Will they be closed um, So, so at the park, would most probably be by by truck. But again, we will have to consider the logistics. We are far from that point, and we will keep you informed. You know, we understand the, the, the wishes of the community, and we will try to satisfy them. Okay, so we are not at that point yet. Okay, um, what? The park cleanup is going to generate most likely a lot less volume of material now that there's not going to be a tank there because they're going to remove some soil, uh, but uh, we expect a fair amount of it will be uh, solidified in place. And so the deeper material uh, won't have to be excavated. Um, you'll be doing solidification instead. First Street Basin is going on timeline-wise that might conflict with other things in the canal? It's be determined. Uh, so First Street Basin will be done. We would prefer that uh, it's being barged uh, by, uh, by, uh, by barge. Okay. Uh, and by the way, we, we have, there's a change in there that we have not, I don't know, the uh, New, York, New York City 
DDC is doing right now the design, and will be completing the design. The construction, uh, there was a change in plans. Uh, the construction will be done by the PRP group that will be cleaning the, the, the rest of the canal. So, uh, by the way, I want to thank Dan from Congressman Alaska's office for joining us. He's been a very engaged uh, partner as the Congressman of this campus. Thanks. And sorry for being late. I was emailing DEP when I was on my way. But, <laughs> so, it, reply to that. But uh, I just had a corollary to that question just because in Red Hook, there's a big project to excavate a lot of soil out of the, rec the ball fields in Red Hook. And the question came up about barging. And we got back from parks that there was issues with uh, a, you know, a licensed facility that's ready to actually take that and the loading on and off of trucks anyway. So I just, as a corollary to that, I just want to make sure that we have a wider view also of other excavation projects where EPA is involved that involves lead in that case, um, where is there opportunity for those synergies to combine resources for the barging if that's not Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, is that? Yes. Um, I just wanted to back to the tunnel really briefly. Um, I'm very eager to hear the fuller presentation and all of your feedback on it. I did want to register that the idea of capturing more combined sewage overflow than the 12 million gallons is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. And whether that's done through this proposal or another proposal, with the existing four and eight million gallon tank, we're still going to have about 115 million gallons of combined switch overflow a year, and we need to reduce that. We're also looking at a proposed rezoning that's going to add a lot more sewage to the neighborhood. Um, so it would be great for EPA to work with DEP to figure out how to mitigate more of that. And again, that gets back to uh, Andrew. Right? So that gets back again to the to the gross trade-offs of time uh, and and impact. Ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, is this part of the uh, future planning of more occupants and inhabitants <coughs> construction of eight, ten story buildings that will be built eventually? Yeah, so, so part of our challenge, yeah, part of our challenge, and I, I would have to defer to, to the city. Uh, again, uh, I was the state legislator uh, for six terms. I was a local official councilman <coughs> supervisor. So uh, I am very respectful of home rule. And so zoning and land use. I, I, it, for the city doing both of that mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so my, my point, ma'am, is that in the state constitution, land use decision making is the, the, the preeminent decision making of local government. So EPA has no authority <coughs> over land use decision making, zoning. We don't have that authority. So, so the city's planning. I, well, I don't know what the city's planning, but, well, but yeah, you have but. the Office of Planning here. Uh, you have the city representatives here. They would be the best ones to answer that question. We, we can't get involved. We can't. We, we have. Why did Tunnel is Oh, I don't know. I, I, it's, we've been approached. The approach to us. Oh, so EPA's only review of tunnel versus tank would be, as, as I mentioned, is there an additional environmental benefit that, that would accrue from constructing the tunnel? So we, we would not be focusing on, uh, yeah, we would not be focusing on population density or, or zoning or housing construction. That, that would be outside of our purview. We, we would be focusing, as is our mission, on environmental impacts. Chrissy? Yeah, and I, I'm happy to leave the details of the tunnel to the next meeting, but because we do have DEP here, I was just wondering if maybe they could share with us a little bit about their motivation for uh, <coughs> switching to the tunnel, and maybe that would help us better understand a little bit to lead off of maybe what Andrea was talking about as well, if that would be possible. Okay. Um, yeah, to, to be perfectly honest, it, it came down to, to cost. Um, so we are proposing soft ground tunnels for um, several other water bodies, including Flushing Bay and Newtown Creek. And as we were developing the plans for those projects, we were also developing, you know, we were proceeding with the planning and design of the two tanks for Gowanus. And um, the costs uh, of the tanks, as, as that cost continued to increase, the tunnel alternative look more attractive. Um, that was a lot of our motivation and we saw that you know potentially pivoting to a tunnel could add some additional benefits as far as scalability 
it's a, in the future potentially additional CSO capture, um, potentially less construction impacts, uh, potentially less footprint, um, that sort of thing. So it started with cost. Diane? Oh, I'm sorry. Buddy? I would have to defer to my colleagues who are working on the site. No, yeah, no, we have not. But we have been in contact with other uh, academic institutions, namely Colombia, that have been involved with the canal here, and so, but not with that particular professor. Uh, okay, I'll ask my three, one, two, three, and then you answer <coughs> order. Number one, the uh, park timeline, I presume you don't have it developed yet, or when do you think you're going to have it developed? Number two, the objects that you're removing from the canal. I would suppose they have to be decontaminated before anybody can cart them out. So who would do it and how would it be done? If somebody wants to take <coughs> those objects out, you, know, you can't just pull stuff out. Or, or else, why do we have a super fund? And uh, the support for businesses. I'd be kind of interested in knowing uh, what kind of a support we're talking about. Okay. So I, I can hit number three, but I'll let Christos handle one and two. Uh, the, uh, the, the number one, I think, here at the beginning. Park timeline. Park timeline. Time timeline for the park. Uh, that's good. The park timeline. The park timeline. Time oh, the timeline for the, right. the park, park excavation at uh, Thomas Green? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. I'm going to start with the, the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the objects have been decontaminated. The, the objects have been, uh, they were clean earth in New Jersey. They were decontaminated and stored uh, in, uh, in, in special containers. So they have been decontaminated, so we would never put, you, uh, put the public at, uh, at risk. Right? They're metal and brick and things like that. They're not. Um so uh, yeah, the metals are rusty, but uh, they are decontaminated. Yeah, okay. uh, with regard to the timeline for the uh, Thomas Green Park, uh, that has not been worked out yet. It will be worked out as uh, we fine tune on the order uh, with uh, National Grid. And, and also, there's some uh, relationship with the work of New York City also, right? With that order. So the, the short answer is we don't have a timeline. George? So, oh, well, I, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so three. back to number three on the businesses. Uh, as, as we focused on what mechanism exists through the Superfund process generally, um, a number of us were of the belief, including the Congresswoman's office, that there was more that we could try to do to provide support. So uh, through the existing process, there is some aid for financial aid for relocation uh, through, I believe it's Army, Army Corps? The, That's for businesses that are required to move as a result of power actions. Correct. Uh, which through the super fund. is a little different with respect to the parcel six, 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 one, one, six, seven. So, so in the conversation, um, we said, well, who else is out there who could play a role in, in providing technical assistance, identifying other pop, potential properties, uh, providing either loans or grants for working capital or improvements to, to our newly acquired structures. So with that, we, we uh, worked to develop a, a, a rigorous and robust list of uh, city agencies, uh, local chambers of commerce, uh, city departments dealing with economic development. Uh, to that, we added state agencies, including the Empire State, uh, uh, Empire state Development Office. Uh, we also added federal agencies, uh, Small Business Administration and others, and, try, and brought them all. And then we invited uh, the businesses uh, to come join us and to, uh, to have a conversation and identify needs or concerns, hoping that they would find a connection with, with any or all of these uh, economic development interests. Uh, the other thing that we did, too, was we, we did signal, um, and, and this actually with the city economic development said that they would be willing to, to where a business identified a need for ongoing support to try to help shepherd them uh, to, to various offices for recognizing that no one agency may, ha may meet all the needs of the business. Um, so that, that was our attempt. That was really a first-time effort to do that. 
But the premise was to augment the existing process, which many of us felt should be or could be strengthened to maximize the ability of these businesses to support somewhere else. Uh, what's, what's the what's the array? Dan, do you have? I'm sorry. That's the kind of no, that was, that was an excellent summary. Yeah, and I know, and, and we work with um, Steve Levin's office too on yeah, follow-up right, uh, well. to, uh, you know, make some connections. Also, Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation that I know is wanted to be of help, and also getting New York City EDC involved because they've been proactive in some cases. So, and, and of course, we have Small Business Services <coughs> and, and other ones. And the degree to which Army Corps could be of help, I know this is an indirect case here. But I did want to acknowledge that we did have an, uh, two businesses from Guans go all the way out to Bushwick, practically Queens, to this event. Uh, so our attendance from Guans was as good as those from Wolfalport that had to be pulled out by the ear, I understand. <laughs> so, so the one thing, and, and, um, and I give reports to the community, and, and I, I value grassroots engagement. Um, I'm not a Pollyanna, and I don't like to overstate. So, uh, certainly for any business to be relocated, you have to pull up, interrupt this business, find a new location, reestablish a new customer base, it is a risk to the business. Um, so I can tell you that, that we don't take that for granted. We're frustrated that it has to occur, but in order to achieve the remedy, um, it, it, to my understanding, that's an unavoidable consequence. So, so our goal was how can we support to the best of our ability and give these folks moms and pops and small businesses a chance to bloom somewhere else, be planted somewhere else in the bloom. So, so that was the intent. So when you're saying somewhere else, you mean outside the Guanas area? Where, wherever they felt that they would want to go. Uh, so, so we didn't, none of us would seek to, seek to dictate where they would move. Uh, ostensibly, whenever a business or a home is dislocated, you would hope they would stay in the community to provide their services, be contributing members. Uh, we saw, I saw in my, my home community, I was raised in the Catskills, during the flooding uh, with buyouts, um, we had a mass exodus. And, and to me, um, I'm not happy to see a one-way ticket for, for valued services, businesses, others to these towns. So that was the intent, was to try to try to help them find a place to relocate. Thank you. You're welcome. George. Um, just one more thought. I wanted to remind <coughs> the CAG that originally the city told us that they had to you, they had to build the tank on the acquired property because of course it would be less expensive than the other method of putting it under the in the park and Christos the main thing I want to remind the CAG is that Christos expressed some reservations that perhaps putting a tank so close to the bulkheads might damage the integrity of the bulkheads and I'm just raising the possibility just to raise it that maybe the city discovered that maybe Christos might have had something there, and they have to come up with a different plan. I'm just saying that. I know we're going to discuss that at a future time, but I remember that Christos was a little bit worried about the proximity to the canal for a large container. If I may, there, there certainly are design issues that have to be dealt with because of the location of the tanks that's now been identified. But uh, in fairness to the city, the city's express reason to not put the tank, the, this particular tank on 34, into the park location was that the park commissioner at that was concerned that that process of building the tank, cleaning up the property and then building the tank there and getting it all operational would take, in his words, a generation of young people growing up in this area wouldn't have the park available to them. Oh, yeah. And so there was that consideration as well, that there was this tension between trying to get the park cleaned up and return it as a park, with a functioning swimming pool and all that, in a faster period of time. And it is probably the case, I mean, it's almost certainly the case that it will go faster if the tanks aren't being built there than if the tank had been built there. It'll still take some time, it's still a complicated project. You have to remove the existing <laughs> pool, you have to dig out the soil, do the solidification that Brian mentioned, uh, and then build a replacement. But that is a comparatively straightforward and simple project, a lot simpler than building the tank with all the ancillary plumbing. So that was the city's stated reason as well. But, but you're right, there, there are design challenges uh, that come from having it located in the other town. 
with the uh, first street basin being excavated, if we take it back in time, it'll show up on the front page of America's history books. It's America's first battlefield site, which means that it actually falls under the American Battlefield Protection Program, as well as New York State rules for the preservation of battlefield sites, not just any battlefield site, America's first battlefield site of the War of Independence, where America's first veterans died. Question to EPA, what will you be doing to comply with federal rules for the protection of American battlefield sites, and will you be mandating setbacks to preserve and comply with federal regulations for battlefield sites? So I'm, I'm going to suggest, at least in the briefings that I've had, that issue has not surfaced. Has that been part of our discussion? Yes. Other team. So I, I would be personally interested in knowing more. Of, 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 I understand that, that you're steep in that knowledge. Um, so just from our standpoint, we would be very interested in understanding um, the, the, the parameters of what you're describing. So, so again, emotionally, all of us, anyone in the room would say, of course, we support our veterans and we support our history. Um, we need to understand the translation of that through this act. The exact footprint of the major buildings that took place are exactly in the first week basin site. So that means some legal triggers kick in. What will the EPA be doing to conform to those legal triggers? So, so oh, I, 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 would like, I would like to say that uh, the, uh, I put the excavation, uh, you know, when I considered the plan for the clean out of the canal, I put the excavation and restoration of the first three basin in there. I, I knew nothing about root. So it was because of input that I received from you, Marlene, me, Rita, Linda, and, and that's so I, just for the record, I want to say that this is happening because of the input of the community. So uh, of course we don't know every, everything, and as the minister have said, that we're going to take that into account, and, and we'll look into it. In general, we're not going deeper or very uh, small enough deeper than the original depth of the basin as it already existed. So the, uh, those types of things are, to our understanding, deeper than that uh, and should not be affected by us restoring the water to the basin as it previously existed. That's, that's a good point. Previously existed in more recent times since post-revolutionary times. But I, I guess my, my premise, and again, I, I was raised in Schoharie Valley, which is a very historic uh, part of the Palatine exodus. Uh, so I, I am very much Steeped, our community is very much steeped in history and we value our history. So I'd be very much interested again in understanding the parameters. And, and again, uh, to the extent that we do no harm, that would be a concern. Uh, but, but I'd also be interested too uh, to an interpretive element, if, 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 that, if that makes sense as well. There might be some interpretive element that, that uh, addresses uh, the significance, because that's, otherwise it's lost to the ages. And I think we all benefit by sharing and continuing that to those memories. So, so again, we look forward to guidance from you. You have my card, so uh, email them for you. Please. Yep. Brad. Yeah. Thanks very much for coming tonight, and apologies for arriving late. Yes, and Brad, I have a letter for you that I've been drafting, so, <laughs> so, so I was waiting for you to arrive. But Great. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, these are three questions about timelines, and if, if these have been answered already, my apologies, and just let me know. But one is, at what point do you have a drop dead deadline by which the EPA will need to know if we're going tanks or tunnel? Has that been established? The decision would have to be made in the relatively near future because whatever delay might be occasioned by switching horses in the middle of the stream would obviously be exacerbated if we don't make that decision soon. But in the meantime, the design, and I don't know if you were in when we said this, the design for the tanks is proceeding. And if the city on their own is choosing to now uh, start to flesh out a design for the tunnel, at the same time, that is their prerogative. Actually, I, I should say there's something that I left out in my update. And so that, that's a good, uh, good point to... And what I left out is that uh, in April, we're going to have the 95% design for the cleanup of RTA1, the, the, the upper canal. And so you weren't here. What I said, what that means is that uh, at that point, 
uh, we will be counting, you know, we will start the countdown for the cleanup of the canal uh, in months and not in years. So there is that, you know, that constraint. Okay. Thank you. And then the other question was, um, I know there was some discussion about Kiwanis Station, but uh, do you know when we will see a draft of the MOA since we haven't seen one since June? Ooh, That's the document on that. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah, so so we have um, we had a draft presented to us. Uh, we had Shippo's feedback. Um, I had contemplated a design uh, myself, uh, just just from my understanding of, of inherent strengths and limitations. Um, so the, the one piece that I discussed, and it, it actually came up with, uh, with Linda and and Marlene, was. I, I don't know if I have the full consensus uh, of the CAG. So, so I've had staff report to me of various engagements, but, but I don't know if there's been any formal full meeting of the CAG and a vote on, on a design or a structure or a direction. Yeah. So we have a resolution which was passed by the entire CAG. Yeah. I believe it was unanimous okay. to say that we reserve 234 projects to the Toronto Board of Distribution Network. So, and as I mentioned, I've been working with information presented to me by sure. staff. So, so did the resolution call for preserving the structure in its entirety? Well, I know that the, preserving architectural elements of it. The one thing I can specifically remember is that the comments that I had prepared to the draft mm -hmm. MOA back in May, yeah. at the June meeting of the CAG, the CAG passed those comments, and that vision of the MOA, at the very least, called for <coughs> preserving the east and a big chunk of the north facade. Right. So, so that's very much in align, okay. alignment with what I conceptualized, okay. which was to preserve a portion of the building, reinforce it, and then provide, again, a kiosk or some interpretive element that help people understand what is this remnant of the structure that we're looking right. at and how does it fit in to the community. That, that was my personal, okay. uh, I, I, I don't know if that has stood. Okay. I, I know there's been other discussions at the staff level, but sure. suffice it to say, I, I, I would be happy to, to see a fuller discussion um, of this issue, I have no problem with that. Okay. Um, no, I, I appreciate you digging into it, yeah. um, because I think the key thing that I've sensed from the CAG talking about this and the community talking about it is keeping some parts of the facade, at the very least, in place, not moved and shifted around, but authentically where they, where they actually were. Um, and then the last question that I had, just to keep things moving, is do you know when we will have a section 106 consultation process for the rest of the Superfund site because this MOA only really treated Kiwanis Station or the, the tank site at the head of the map. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, we we are working and we're trying to bring it to you as uh, as uh, soon as possible. Okay. Uh, so we have had uh, very very recent conversations with the archaeologist and uh, we are working. Uh, for uh, the programmatic agreement, what we call the programmatic agreement, and we hope to bring it to you again as soon as possible. But you're going to have, okay, in 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 within a reasonable time. Okay. <laughs> Chris has to go. Chris has to go. I did want to point out so we have an archaeology resolution about the first street basin, um, and I just, we assume that that's part of. Um, the review that will go on while that excavation happens, uh, that we look at the three you know, very different time periods, uh, not just industrial, but very early industrial and, and revolutionary war time, and the mill times, you know, um, early times that took place there. Yes, so so that, 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 that resolution still stands. That should be, I would be, be, be yeah. part of the 106. Right, um, and taken into account. And, and the first basin will be uh, subjected to all the uh, you know, the standards that we apply, the archaeological standards that we apply to uh, the Superfund site. But specifically, we wanted it addressed a little more tightly than the rest of the canal you wanted because the, yeah. of the history. Okay, so yeah. that will be taken into account in the programmatic agreement, and then you will have a chance to, uh, to review it and, and we'll have a discussion about it. Okay, so the point is well taken. Chris. Yeah, so I just I want to say that the amount of information that's being shared with us tonight is just tremendous, um, and it's really useful for us as a CAG. 
as is the dialogue and back and forth that we can have when we have all of these experts here. And so something that I want to make sure of is going forward um, in the Superfund process as the, the process begins to speed up and we get more and more information that we can make sure that we have our experts here at all of our meetings. Um, whether that be our experts from EPA, um, we have some letters that we'll talk about later uh, addressed to our city agencies, but um, the, I, I just like to be certain that this, this can continue and we can continue to have this dialogue at our CAD meetings to come. Yeah, so from the RA position, uh, to me this is the strength of, of engagement. So, so we support that and our goal would be to bring resources to you as, as often as we can uh, in, for meaningful engagement. So we want to make sure that there's a scope of work that you'd like to describe. Uh, but again, I, I try not to pull my staff out of, out of uh, their normal work hours too often, but I know that they're passionate about it, they're happy to do it. Uh, so, so you tell us what you'd like to talk about. We'll identify the team that we can best bring, and we'd be happy to. But again, it may not be us. It might be a, 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 another. It might be the city, on the, so or it may be some other partner. Right. Just quick follow-up question. Thank you. Of I, course. Um, I think it's when I just want to be clear that when the onus is on us to sort of identify what issues we want to talk about, um, that sort of prevents us from getting information that maybe we could be hearing. Yeah. What's most helpful is just when. I our our yep. our experts can be here at every meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I hear you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I would say, as you know, uh, there has been a hiatus, and uh, uh, and I hope uh, we are over it. Yeah, we hope so too. As you know, we are readily available, and mm -hmm. we spend like three hours explaining to you. We meet with groups. Uh, outside, uh, you know this uh, this gathering. Uh, so uh, yeah, our intent is uh, to be available to you. Uh, the, the other extension of that too, and, and I, I um, and I'll just say this: I started as a local official at age 21 in my home village, uh, and um, so I spent 36 years as a trustee, a councilman, a supervisor, a county legislator, an assembly member, and for me. Um, to me, the strength of engagement is, is my, my email was grassroots Pete. That was my email. So, so I view substantive engagement at the community level as, as the strength of this project. So, that's, so, so I don't want to put the whole burden on the community. And just to be clear, Chris's point is well taken. We don't want you to try to second guess and think, oh my gosh, what point of sensitivity is there out there that we should be thinking of and asking questions of? That's not fair to you. So I can tell you that when, when we meet with staff, I meet with my colleagues, I'm not, not even going to call them staff, my colleagues, um, there's a lot of intense questioning, a lot of brainstorming. Um, a number of us come from different walks of life. So I use the term constructive tension, where we come from different worldviews and we kind of test our beliefs, our experiences out against each other for the same goal. Um, sometimes our meetings last longer than <coughs> folks might like them to. Um, but I, I would say to you that we're trying to think of impacts from quality of life, from environmental, from economic, from, from community character. We're trying to think as much as we can within our limits of points of sensitivity, trying to bring them to community and try to anticipate uh, impacts and, and mitigation. So, so to your point, it's not fair to put it all on the can. And we're not going to. And we're going to continue to, to test each other. Uh, we, we have a lot of fun. Um, there are a lot of bad puns. That's my fault in the meetings. Uh, but we do have some very serious deliberation uh, on points of, of concern to, to, to any level of detail. Uh, and one more point, if I heard you correctly, uh, we have been pretty transparent and we intend to continue the transparency. So I heard you say bring in other groups uh, and we have brought the PRPs and they have to make a presentation of what work they have done. We have brought the city, you know, including the city. You know, and, and so uh, I, I believe that we are going to continue working on that manner. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Peter. Uh, just going back to 234 Butler a little bit, uh, and what Brad was saying, I mean, we're all trying to be realistic, cooperative CAG members, and if the whole building can't be saved because there's an 8 million gallon tank in a headhouse, that's one thing, and the facade's great, but 
if there is no 8 million gallon tank, obviously moving everything 20 feet south and saving the whole building, I think would be the entire CAG's preference. Uh, we would have to vote on that, but I'm, I'm just saying that if we're going conceptual after years of frustration trying to figure out exactly what piece of furniture can go on top of the tank, and now there is no tank, we'd really love carte blanche to save the building and reconsider the placement of everything just a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would want to build up also on something that Andrea and Peter just said, uh, which is that when you make the decision, or before you make the decision, of deciding whether or not the tank is viable versus the uh, tunnels, we would like to know what that decision is based upon and what the parameters are. If everything else is equal and the timeline for doing a tunnel isn't going to all of a sudden uh, expand the whole process by a couple of hundred years, uh, but we get bigger capacity out of the tunnel, I think basically that's what we would like to see. But we still have to know what the parameters of your decision are. And I hope you give us that opportunity to weigh in on that. Yes, absolutely. So, and again, from any uh, further from my colleagues here is, I've asked for an objective read, and again, I have some staff who have a certain point of view already. I've asked them to set that aside. And I've also uh, been reaching out to the city so that we can understand more clearly, get more information. Um, the information that we use to make that decision uh, is intended to be based on uh, a scientific understanding and also a procedural understanding of uh, weighing these, these two different constructs, uh, the time it takes to execute and the environmental benefit. So we, we would we would be uh, it would be improper for us to, to not lay that out for full review. So so that would have to be so people will want to know the neighbors will want to know the county will want to know uh, local officials will want to know taxpayers will want to know uh, any number of folks. So, so so that that would be incumbent in the process. And we try to quantify as best we can what what were the various pros and cons that led to to a specific decision. Well, and even before you make the decision, assuming that everything is, there's always a plus and a minus. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, and I, and I guess, um, I guess procedurally. <laughs> sure, we would, before this decision is finalized, I think yeah. that's Lewis's point, is that yeah. we would have, he has suggested and, and Kevin has indicated that he thinks that that would be uh, received well, an invitation from the CAG to the city to come and give you a more detailed presentation about it. Obviously, Pete's going to be hearing from the city is going to hear from our own staff. But before a decision is made on the EPA side, we will certainly be listening to you and trying to interact and engage with you and hear your thoughts and your concerns uh, and factor that into the final decision. Fair enough. Diane. I just want to, first of all, I want to underscore what was said. We would really like to have the people from EPA at our meetings. I sorely have missed them in recent months, and I am so grateful to have them here tonight. And I think it's really important for us as we continue. That's number one. Number two, I really would like for Liz to see this canal clean. <laughs> I really, really would like to. So I hope nothing, nothing will delay the timeline that Christos has shared with us in the past. I really hope that happens. And um, I want to know that every PRP is as cooperative as they can be, because I think that's critically important. Brad, I'll take public questions when the CAG's finished. Buddy, do you want to say something? I just wanted to say $458 million was spent to fund the development and operation of the Red Oak Sewer Treatment Plant. On top of that, some odd. $50 million was sent on the Flushing Tunnel at Bergen and DeGraw Street, connecting the waters of the Guanus Canal with the waters between us and Governor's Island. Did you comment on that? <laughs> the cost or the time? Or the $458 million, as I understand it, has already been spent. 
nobody talks about it like it never happened. On top of that, we had a flushing tunnel that was inoperable for years. We got some 50 odd million dollars from the congressman to get that thing done. And this goes on and on and on. If I may pick up on Buddy's point, we already paid for a huge tunnel under Butler Street that is right. sitting empty. It can hold hundreds of millions of gallons, so I'm scratching my head, picking up on Buddy's point, why millions of dollars are being spent on infrastructure that is not being used. Why is the Butler Street Tunnel inoperable uh, and we've already paid so for it as taxpayers? My answer would be, I don't know, but, but I'm not afraid to ask the owners of the tunnel or the folks who developed it. That, that is a fair question. Um, and again, in any conversation, you'll find with me and I know with my staff, if we don't know the answer, we're not going to make something up. We'll do our best to research and come back with, with a thoughtful, knowledgeable response. Um, so, so if there are issues, as you pointed out, they can be highlighted. I, I, the city has been a very communicative partner. Uh, I have the ability to reach out to the commissioner at any moment, uh, and he's been very responsive. Uh, so I would say if there are additional questions, we can send them to the city, and if you want to, to copy us or our partners at DEC or DOH as you send the communication, um, that's fine too. It just makes more people aware of the, of the ask. Uh, I think ultimately, for all of us, and, and this is our shared goal here, we, we want quality of life, uh, we want uh, <coughs> peaceful surroundings, we want a clean environment, we want a healthy economy. So we're all united. The issue is, what's the process that gets us there? And what investments are needed. And, and we have a history here uh, uh, of, of legacy contamination that was part of our country's growth and economic development that we have to fix. Um, uh, growing up, I was taught a long time ago, and I'm sure everyone shares this, uh, I'm not very sad because I get older, um, you always want to leave a place better than how you found it. So, so I think that resonates. I don't think that you would find anyone in this room who doesn't share that sentiment. I think we all want to, to, to have this community better and stronger and healthier than how we found it. So, so any information, ideas, thoughts, share them with us. We'll share them with our colleagues, and we'll move forward. Brad, just wanted to piggyback on what Chrissy had been saying earlier and what you were mentioning about community engagement. Yeah. Uh, one thing, because I head up a canoe club along the canal, yeah. and we have tons of people coming How's your to <laughs> Not too bad. Not too bad? Good. We have a bunch of people coming in the door, random people from all walks of life. And the people in this room are passionately, deeply engaged in community affairs. But many of the people who walk through our door or participate in our programs are not. They're very passively Understood. aware of what's happening with the process. My question is, is there a way that EPA, as more work keeps happening with the cleanup, can put up basic signage, for example, along the 4th Street Turning Basin, there was no sign up at any point that just said to a random person walking by, here's what's happening here, and it, it was just one page long. There really, really needs to be some elementary explanation of what's happening. Oh, the work in progress. Yes. To me, that sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To me, that's, that's instructive, it's enlightening, and encourages me to participate. Uh, from my standpoint, I don't think that that would be a costly thing to do at all. So when when EPA does, when EPA pays for cleanup because there are no PRPs, then we typically have a sign on the construction fence somewhere saying, this is the so-and-so super fun side and the work is being done, EPA and so forth. Uh, in this case, of course, work is done by the responsible parties, either the National Grid or the city and the other PRPs participating as appropriate. Um, or the bulkheads heads that are being installed from time to time as individual property owners need to do so. So I'm going to interrupt my DRA. He's the deputy regional point. administrator. I'm the regional administrator. Uh, not to pull right No, no, you're right. But <laughs> my, premise, my premise is I'm not afraid to ask the question. All just points well taken is that someone else is paying. For it. So, so the participants would have to be willing yeah. and acknowledge that there's a community interest that they're willing to support. We couldn't legally force them to do it. We can legally force them to remove certain contaminants, mitigate to a certain standard. We can force them to do that. We, we don't like to force them if they're willing. But there's nothing wrong with floating out an idea and saying, maybe, or would you be willing? So, so to that extent, the answer would be yes. And, and that's my guess. So, so 
to the extent that there could be interpretive elements at any phase of construction. Um, so um, we, we did have fact sheets at the beginning that we handed out, and um, we thought about a sign, and because a lot of this was essentially private property, we didn't identify a, a good spot for that. The Whole Foods is not a PRP, and we imposed quite a bit on them in various ways, shapes, and forms, uh, but your point is well taken, and, and we will, uh, we will make that happen. What about the bridges, Brian? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's all yeah. right. so, so I, I guess I would leave it to, to to the CAG, and we can think about what vehicle. So whether, again, it's a community newsletter, whether it's uh, increased uh, outreach to the press, whether there's uh, an information area where, where it's material can be posted, um, we're open to suggestions. <coughs> yeah. And again, we can't compel right. the PRPs, but, but my sense would be for the modest cost and the, and the goodwill that we give to the community, I would think that they, I think they'd be willing. That'd be my guess. Yeah, I think it's going to be incorporated. I think a static sign that yeah. has a very basic textual description of what's going on, a pictogram, on? and no fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some, we have, a, we have a long sign history here. Let me get the, me get the people in order. Marlene? What kind of no fish? Fish on a plate. What's going on here? Hey, guys. Yeah, I wanted to comment, first of all, thank you for sharing us that your initial start in politics are very low um, at the beginning in grassroots and working yes. with the community. Yep. And um, I wanted to point out that uh, this CAG has actually uh, uh, creates a very unique body of community participation that yes. doesn't exist in our city. Yes. That um, our first tier of elected government in our city, we stand in one in 160,000. Yeah. that we don't really have local community government I and mean, participation when Brad talks about other people not participating, there just aren't these vehicles. And we really appreciate that the EPA has um, allows this body to exist and supports this body and spends the time with us whenever they can, hopefully on a monthly basis. That this has been, a, uh, I think, a real important part of, of um, why there's an active community around this, this cleanup. You know, it's very important to us, and we appreciate that. And I just wanted to let you know that you. that this is a very unique happening within um, uh, community input uh, that doesn't happen in our city in any other capacity. We wish our city had more more events or, or CAGs or organizations like this, but there aren't, and I think that's why there's not as much community engagement around other issues and things. And I think the, the team has been very transparent, very open, and um, we, we want to see that go forward. And that's why we know there's a law, we were wondering what's going on. But uh, I think, they think this, the, this model is a good working model. The community, both bylaws for running the organization. Yes, we need the support of somebody like D Doug to help manage it. But it, uh, it allows, I think, for a lot of interaction with our government that we don't have otherwise. We appreciate the reinforcement. And again, I, I, I am just happy to, to have been here for the last year to find uh, an entity. And again, I have to tell you, my time with EPA has been incredibly um, humbling and, and, um, and uh, honorable. Uh, um, let me say this, this is honorable work. I, I feel very gratified to, to be here. So to find groups and individuals who are thoughtful, engaged, um, uh, community-minded, uh, is to me, that's a reinforcement. So, so thank you for that for your feedback. You, you, you make the game. The tag is it. And, and, I, and my sense is my colleagues uh, are happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. Um, I know my colleagues are happy to, to be part of this process. Yeah. Lewis? Yeah, and maybe what I'm going to say requires a letter to you from our land use committee or something similar, but I think Brad's idea of a stationary sign is fantastic. I think that's something that for public relations should be done. And I think a sign should contain not only what's being done, but what you expect to happen after it's done, yeah. and then the time frame in which all of this action is taking place. Yeah. yeah. And understood. So something that, again, provides clear communication is interpretive, gives constructive guidance, recognizing that um, any project ebbs and flows, so there may have to be modifications or updates to the information. And maybe uh, a line, uh, who to contact if you have questions. Sure, of course. Yep. Okay. Diane and Marianne. I think I, I'm really supportive of what Lewis just said. 
and I think one or even two stationary, they can be identical signs on, on maybe the Union Street Bridge and on the other, the other bridge, uh, just so that people can stop and say, oh, that's what is happening. Okay, we've gone this far. I think that is so critical, and if the BRPs, like you say, if you can't make them do that, I think EPA has a public affairs committee that have the brand division that is... This could be made to happen. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I, I just think it's it. a really, really great idea. No, we, we support it. It can be done cost effectively. Mary Ann? Okay. Um, I've been a tank member from the very beginning. I create buttons and the propaganda that help push along and get ourselves nominated. I believe that the purpose of the K is to get to the community through their voice, through their blogs, through their newsletters, through whatever, whatever the case may be. And then we signage doesn't always get read. So it's a, a pointless, uh, to me, it's pointless to have a waste of money and time to do something when we, as a community advisory group, supposed to be out there con connecting to all the organization members. And Katya, who is not here, has a blog that reaches out to over 5,000 people that read her blog and knows exactly what's happening, which I'm taping for her right now. Um, <laughs> plus the fact that um, I have never trusted many government agencies, but by far, from the very beginning, the Regional 2 team, from Walter to Crystal's Brian to Natalie, are the on um, top of my list as the most. Um, Concerned, are public, oh, not public, but government uh, people that have come to us and given us everything the transparency and the truth of, and the best ways to do things. And we have always relied on them greatly, um, leaving other agencies I'm not going to mention. Um, so it'll have to be Natalie's personal cell phone number on that sign. <laughs> <laughs> just, just her picture and a QR code. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap up. That, uh, we're going to wrap up the CAT questions. We probably have a minute or two if the regional administrator is willing to take a question or two from non-CAG members. Any, any other non-CAG members with questions? Yes, so, if you move forward with the tunnel, would there still be a need for a headhouse? I wasn't. Yes. There... My, my understanding is yes. I have to defer to our engineering team. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yes. like, would there any be? Would there be any excess land that has already been acquired that's going to be wasted now if you move forward with the tunnel? So I'm, again, we, we only have a cursory understanding of the tunnel, so we don't have a sense of the full footprint. If you remove, I think there was a, an acknowledgement that if you don't put a tank in, that that would free up some space. Um, you still would have to have the head house, so you have to conceptualize what, you know, if you don't put the tank in, the tunnels are going to be underneath. What happens if, if you don't place the tunnel or the tanks? What, what, what is that remaining space? What use is it put to? So I, I, I could say if it was wasted, I think we heard one, one of your colleagues, your neighbors, say it might be room for more resident or more recreational area. So I, I Okay, but that's, that land will still be used. It's not like they did that acquisition for, for nothing. I, I guess right. I, I couldn't <laughs> comment. The city is nodding its head And and again, we're we are gonna invite the, the city in to give us a detailed um, description. Yes, Mayor. Yes, um, obviously for the last few years we've been hearing about how necessary the tanks were and how necessary they had to be placed specifically on specific parcels. And for the last two years we've heard so much convincing about why they should have been placed there. So studies obviously were done and budgets were put in place for that specific concept. So at this point now that the concept is changing or the project is changing or there's a new proposal in place, um, at what point 
one, were studies made for this change? And two, at what point was this proposed, this change? The so tunnel versus the, t the, the tanks. At what point was this proposal changed? Yes, so, so, so what we're hearing is sometime during the summer, the concept was floated, and we've been getting information from the city, but not enough to, to, to have any real way of measuring or monitoring, uh, assessing impact. Uh, so so that, that's, but, but again, the whole premise was uh, anyone can float an idea, but if there are forces in motion, as you've heard, uh, people, are, people are going to be reticent to, to change a horse midstream unless there's a good reason to do that. So, so back to your point, we've had some, some, some I, w I don't want to say quiet conversation, we've had some, the city come and say to us, we, we're thinking about this, and the city is now beginning to surface with more discreet uh, concepts. Um, but that, that process is, in terms of an engineering and designing standpoint, that's relatively, relatively fresh. So, so then what's the point of the CAG knowing or having full disclosure about what the possible projects would be for a community if they're not notified during the process of it all? I mean, it seems as if they're being just told, okay, this is what is now being proposed. I mean, this body should be a part of that process, you would think. Sure. That is their whole purpose. Yeah, and I, I guess I would say to you, uh, from an engagement standpoint, if an idea is floated, the idea has to have some substance to, to have, be, have meaningful conversations. So you can float an idea, but, but until you have detail in front of you that helps you understand the, the, the meets and bounds, the costs and benefits, there's, there's, you can say tunnel versus tank, but that's meaningless until you put something in front that, that helps people understand what's the translation of that. Because I, I don't know myself. I've heard a concept described to me, but I can tell you EPA is not in a position to say tunnel over tank. Right now we're proceeding with, with the tanks. That's what we know. You've heard that from our colleagues. We don't even know if the tunnel concept is viable. Uh, we don't know if it would be acceptable. So, so our, our recommendation is as, as the discussion gets more serious, to, to have the, the applicant really city step forward and tell us more about it and that's something that's why we're happy to, to again have the, the city come and share that with the CAG because they're in a position where they can talk about it but just because they talk about it doesn't mean that that's that that's the direction we headed. Right. I'm just basing it based on the fact that we heard tonight that one of the major principles of the change was because of budget and so if that's the underlying reason because of budget I'm sure that a budget would have been put in place from the beginning as to how much this project would cost. <coughs> you can't just propose something to the community and then acquire property and then at some point decide, okay, this isn't working and let's just revert back to something else. Because I'm pretty sure there has to there has to be a study put in place. Yes, there has so to be some kind of a you know a budget put in place. From an EPA standpoint. And I know that community members, CAC members brought up the fact that budget is going to be an issue, that it's going to, you know, it's going to get to the point where too much money is going to be put out, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, for, for acquiring property and so forth and projects and building, but, and now it's gone back to the same thing being a budget issue, being, you know. Yeah, so, so. from an EPA standpoint, uh, we're not, I don't know what their budget issue is with tunnel versus tank. I can tell you that as we mitigate, and this is this is just the nature of Superfund engagement, is we want a remedy that's going to be effective. So, so the budget, I, I hate to say it this way, and I, my PRPs can close their ears, we, we don't ask them what their budget is. We go out and we assess what is the, the work that's required to protect public health and the environment, and then the budget is a consequence of what's the best solution for doing that. So, so that's our engagement here. So I, 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 I'm not looking to be disrespectful to the city or to National Grid or any other PRP. We don't go and ask them how much are you willing to spend. We don't do that. We, we, we step out and say, what is the process? What's, what's needed to protect public health and the environment? And then we try to work that through uh, with our engineers, our technicians, our consultants, peer review to, to move in that direction. Uh, so again, tunnel versus tank, the, the one thing that I heard that resonates is 
is there an ability for more effective CSO capture? And what does that mean for our water bodies? If you can capture more effluent and treat it and force it to go through a treatment system versus letting it run into the canal or into another water body, is that something we should at least look at? And it, to me, it makes sense to at least look at it. And understand. I'm sorry, Walter. Yeah, and so, and again, and for Sal and, I'm sorry, Lena? Yes. For Sal and Lena, again, affected property owners, the question is, if there's a tunnel versus tank, what does that mean for, for their property that's that's being acquired by the city? I, I, I guess I'd have to defer to my team. And no, I think Kevin can answer it, but right. our understanding is that they would use the property for the tunnel just as they would use it for the tank. It might have a smaller footprint, but that the property Actually, I should say properties, plural, because there are, as you know, several, three different parcels uh, along the canal. Is that a fair statement, Kevin? Absolutely. And again, we will, we're, the CAG is inviting the city to have a more detailed discussion of this in the future. So uh, I want to wrap this up. Susan, quickly, if you have more well, questions. I just want, well, you know, we see various visual presentations already, so is that going to be trashed and then? Reset with a new presentation of where the tunnels and areas are going to be used and stuff. I mean, you know, like to keep us informed more visually as we're discussing it now. Yeah, I, I would say our goal would be to present the information in whatever format is most useful to the CAG. Mm -hmm. so, I'm sorry. 3D. <laughs> <laughs> 3D model. Or 3D scale modeling. That's right. We're, we're going to hand out good visualization <laughs> glasses, yeah, everybody. So, let's, let me go. I'll raise, I, I, I guess I'll temper that within reason. <laughs> so, but to, to, uh, so, so again, uh, the city will present. And again, they're going to be presenting to us, too. We haven't drawn any conclusions. We don't have enough information to determine. I've already told you that there, some of my staff have opinions already. Uh, but those are staff opinions, and my goal is to, to be as objective about this as possible. But again, you're part of this process. So I want to move us along and thank the regional yeah. administrator. If I may, if I may. So I just want to say in closing, and you know this because you, you have my colleagues at your disposal on a regular basis, our conversation is not limited to one evening, it's not limited to a couple of hours. This is an ongoing process. And again, we're very happy to, to be with you. So if, if you want me back at any time, just say, hey, where the heck's Pete? And I'll say, okay. Rashford's Pete. Rashford's Pete. Pete. I'll, I'll be happy to join you. Okay. Whatever, whatever you like. So thank you again. Thank you so much.